oops, you know, something. Um, our, <laughs> our author is substantially taller than I am, and uh, <laughs> so I don't know. I do not know whether I dare touch this or not. So uh, maybe I'll do this. How does that sound? Uh, um, can, I, can all of you hear me all right? That's great. That's a great. So, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first uh, Chancellor's Lecture of the Spring Semester 2007. Um, the Chancellor's Lecture Series invites accomplished and innovative speakers to Vanderbilt University in order uh, that their knowledge and their insight may integrate with that of our students, our staff, our faculty, and of, so, and of course so many members of our community. This evening we are proud to welcome Jane Smiley, novelist, short story writer, critic, and essayist. Jane Smiley was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1992 for her novel, A Thousand Acres, a modern version of King Lear set in a farming community in Iowa. Her other publications include uh, Horse Heaven, The Age of Grief, a collection whose title novella was the source material for the film The Secret Lives of the Dentist, and Moo, uh, you don't need to say Moo, after me, a Moo, uh, a novel of, uh, of academic intrigue, a topic of which I know a great deal, I might add. Um, <laughs> Ms. Smiley's clear, precise, and confident work uh, has managed over the years uh, uh, as she has been publishing to bridge the gap between academic audiences and popular audiences. She also applies her expansive imagination to essay and critical writing through her frequent contributions to publications such as The New Yorker, and to Harper's Weekly, turning the eye of her wit to topics ranging from impulse buying to horse training to American literature. In her role as a critic and cultural observer, she has never shied from taking less popular or even a heterodox view. Ms. Smiley's lecture this evening will be in a critical vein, an extension of her first book-length work of nonfiction, 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel. She began this project after September 11, 2001, when her impulse to write temporarily failed. So not being inclined to write, Miss Smiley decided instead to read, to immerse herself in 100 novels. From her decision and her purposeful journey arise this work and tonight's lecture. In 13 ways, Jane Smiley brings her critical facilities to contemplate what factors cause a novel to function or to falter, the form of the novel itself, the pleasures of reading, and how novels have affected her over the course of her own life. This evening, we are therefore honored to benefit from this very important insight. Ladies and gentlemen, please, enjoy, uh, please join me in welcoming Jane Smiley. Well, thank you for having me. I love that emergency warning. I can't wait for the tornado to hit. I moved to California um, after, uh, at that point, about 48 years of, of terror uh, living in St. Louis and Iowa, um, uh, terror of tornadoes. But uh, now I don't have to worry because we've had some tornadoes in California too, so I can get that, that thrill um, that I miss so much. Um, there's a, I have to say this is a whole book and I can't lecture about the whole thing. So I was trying to decide what it was I wanted to talk about. And lo and behold, I realized that I have this book coming out on February 15th. <laughs> um, and this book is called 10 Days in the Hills. And uh, I wrote the back ad which said this novel is rated R. Um, contains salacious situations, adult conversations, some nudity, gossip, not recommended for children. And I also wrote the blurb. Um, <laughs> uh, this book takes place in Hollywood, so I, the blurb I wrote, one of them was compelling, Boccaccio with a hint of Black Hawk Down and just a touch of Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> I, I attributed that one to Pauline Saras. And then um, the other one, amazing, Dr. Zhivago, but funny. <laughs> I, I attributed that one to Michelangelo Bergman. <laughs> um, and I thank them for their uh, 
their reading of my novel. Um, but this, this novel is related to this book because one of the first books that I read um, after 9-11 uh, was The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. And it, I loved it. I had never read it before, and I had heard of it, of course. And it was such a wonderful book to read. I was reading it during the anthrax scare. And as, as worried as we were about anthrax, we really knew that the Black Death was not in our future. Um, and it was reassuring to know that. Uh, but I found the Decameron so inspiring that I eventually decided to rewrite the Decameron and um, set it in, in our day. And so what I'm going to do is read a little bit. So the topic of my, of my talk this evening is influence, it authors, novelists' influence on one another. And not too long ago, uh, I believe it was Harold Bloom wrote a book called The Agony of Influence. And I'm here to tell you, there is no agony about it. Um, it's it, an absolute joy to steal ideas from earlier writers, <laughs> especially when they're dead. And one of the things that I learned uh, in reading my 100 novels, uh, which really came out to more like 130 because Proust only has one entry, but he did write seven novels. And um, there's one entry for the two books of um, Trollope's that I read. Uh, but one thing I did learn from reading my uh, hundred some novels was how closely related all those novelists were. And so I'm going to read a little bit about that from this book. And then I'm going to read something I stole from Boccaccio from this book. And then I hope that you'll ask questions and we can and, and we can make our conversation get broader for that from that. So this is from chapter seven called The Art of the Novel. For many generations, the novel had no pretensions to art. The novel was not rooted in classical, rhetorical, and imaginative forms, nor taught in schools and universities. Because novels were read for pleasure rather than quote unquote improvement, novelists were from the beginning autodidacts, reading their own idiosyncratic courses of novels, picking and choosing what to emulate and imitate, often writing in secret and pleasing themselves first of all rather than teachers or scholars. Numerous novels published anonymously or under pseudonyms, Madame de Lafayette, excuse me, numerous novelists published anonymously or under pseudonyms, Madame de Lafayette, Daniel Defoe, Jane Austen, the Brontes, George Eliot, doing so because they had something to lose by claiming their work, usually respectability. Novelists who published under their own names were often those who were not socially prominent or who, like Samuel Richardson and Henry Fielding, already had literary lives before they began to write novels. Artistically, novelists were do-it-yourselfers, and what they knew about the novel, they gleaned from their favorite authors. We know from their own testimony that Forster read James, James read Dickens, Dickens read Smollett, Smollett read Cervantes, Cervantes read Marguerite of Navarre, Marguerite read Boccaccio, and of course, Forster read Cervantes, Dickens read Scott, Scott read Boccaccio, Scott read Cervantes, Fielding read Cervantes, Dickens read Cervantes, Wolfe read Austen, Dickens and James, Stendhal read Marguerite of Navarre, Balzac read Stendhal, James read Balzac, Turgenev read Stendhal, Stendhal read Madame de Lafayette, Madame de Lafayette read Marguerite de Navarre, Dostoevsky read Turgenev, Tolstoy read Turgenev, Gogol read Turgenev, Turgenev read Lermontov, Lermontov read Scott, Kanazaki read Tolstoy, Dostoevsky and Lady Murasaki, and so forth. Though some novelists have had classical educations, many such as Defoe, Dickens, and almost every woman had a Shakespeare-type education, small Latin and less Greek. Many novelists' innovative and lively attachment to vernacular speech 
and up to the minute forms of expression remained uncontaminated by the early drudgery of translating long passages of Latin and Greek. There was nothing correct about the novel to begin with, and so every author was free to experiment with what might be incorrect but satisfying. When their own compositions became famous and popular, each novelist's techniques entered into both the narrative and the technical lexicon of the novel. Seminal novelists and others made a technical contribution to the art of writing novels along with a contribution to the treasury of stories, settings, and characters. Later novelists testified to their influence. Cervantes showed not only that a long narrative of an innocent man traveling about the countryside had virtually unlimited plot possibilities, but also that a narrative voice talking about such adventures in a chatty way was both agreeable and reassuring. Madame de Lafayette showed, that not only <coughs> showed not only that all three participants in a love triangle could be equally sympathetic, but also that a narrator could efface herself sufficiently to seem to enter transparently into the thoughts of each of the participants, thereby raising the story above the level of gossipy speculation and into the, lev into the realm of philosophy. When Daniel Defoe wrote in the different voices of Robinson Crusoe, Moll Flanders, H.F., Ro Roxana, and the others, he showed that an author could do two things at one time, observe his protagonist and embody him, giving the reader a rich, empathetic experience while maintaining control of the themes that the life of the protagonist represented. Each specific contribution was not necessarily invented by each seminal novelist. Every period was full of inventors and novelists who are now lost in general obscurity, but who were nevertheless read by their contemporaries whose new ideas were nos noticed and made use of. Technical ideas about the craft of novel writing are not intellectual property except insofar as they are wedded to particular words written in particular se sequences. Rather, techniques are subtle expansions of perception that stimulate a reader's thoughts about his own ideas and perceptions in new ways. The novel, in fact, requires technical innovation because there is simply no way to make the time pass when the characters exist within a particular setting without being inventive. Even if I set out to rewrite Don Quixote incident by incident with the merest detail change, let's say the action happens 10 years after the action of the real Don Quixote, I will be presented with some challenge or other that requires a technical solution. Perhaps the reign of one king has given, away, given way to that of another, or two or three laws governing travel from town to town have changed, or deforestation has altered part of Quixote's landscape. If a handful of details about Quixote's journal, journey are no longer plausible, then those details ramify into other scenes, and pretty soon I have a different novel altogether, as indeed Cervantes himself had a different novel in the second volume of Don Quixote from the novel he had in the first. Great seminal novelists may or may not be more rawly original than their contemporaries. What they do is manage to wed originality of technique with depth of insight or breadth of knowledge or charm or some other quality that demonstrates the value of that technical innovation and makes it memorable to future novelists. So, Boccaccio, although he's, although he's not considered a novelist, was an innovative storyteller. And in the Decameron, which is um, a set of 100 stories told over 10 days, that's the Decameron aspect, um, by 10 tale tellers, um, he was expressly trying to do a medieval thing, which is do a compilation of stories that came from other sources. Um, but he was also interested in the phenomenon of the Black Death. And so he gave his, uh, his 10 storytellers, seven women and three men, a reason to leave Florence, namely they were escaping the Black Death, and a reason to tell the stories 
namely that they were in some sense trying to avoid thinking about the cataclysm that was going on around them. Um, in order to uh, keep his hundred stories and his ten characters and all the characters in the hundred stories distinct in the reader's mind, he did something that medieval writers did not, were not likely to do because they didn't think in the same way that modern writers do. He individualized his characters. He gave them specific motives. He gave them specific lifestyles. He gave them intentions. Um, he gave them quirks and idiosyncrasies. So if you go back and read the Decameron, which is a huge book, it's like 800 pages long, it does not run together in a mush. You do keep everything distinct in your mind because he was such a master at understanding the telling detail. He also did a thing that I thought was really uh, interesting, which was he lived in, a, in Florence, of course. We have to think of Florence not as New York, not as a great um, center of, of culture the way we think of it today, but more as Los Angeles or Dallas. The center of culture was in Naples, and he had lived there for quite a long time, but then his father lost his money, and he insisted that Giovanni return to Florence. And Giovanni returned to Florence the way someone might return from New York to Dallas. You know, he was disappointed in the culture that he found. He thought it was crass. He thought it was money-oriented. He thought it was bourgeois. And it was because, um, of course, the big banking families were the social leaders. And it was also in a crisis in even before the Black Death hit because there had been a King Edward III of England had um, reneged on his war debts. Where have we seen that before? And um, he had caused the failure of two big banking houses in Florence. And so there was a, there was a economic downturn and there was a pandemic raging simultaneously, but all Giovanni could think about was sex. Um, or at least that's, the, that's what they say about him. But I, I found the Decameron much richer than that. And, it, and while it is in some sense a compendium of um, what we would consider erotic stories, um, to me it's also a compendium of ideas about how life goes on no matter how profound the disaster uh, raging around you. Um, and that's what I found inspiring about it when I was reading it in 2001, that, um, that I could be taken away from our uh, present, uh, our cataclysm at the time, the, the, the World Trade Center attacks and the dangers that we all felt around us, and and returned to a different time where the dangers were even greater, and yet the, the storytellers and through them, Boccaccio, could just could not help himself uh, reaffirming life. He couldn't help himself. Um, so when I when I came to write my new novel, I knew that I'd, I had known for a long time that I wanted to write a novel about Hollywood. And um, I thought, well, you know, I will write my novel by taking the Decameron as my model. I later found out that Goethe had had the same idea, but he didn't get anywhere with it. And so I felt I was in good company, me, Marguerite of Navarre, uh, who rewrote the Decameron and in the 1550s, and then Goethe, who wanted to do it again in the 1700s, and then me. I thought, well, that's pretty good. Two men, two women. Two women got it done, two men did. <laughs> One of the men did. Uh, anyway, so obviously my, I found things sneaking in from Boccaccio that maybe I hadn't thought of, but clearly my uh, Decameron was going to be erotic, otherwise I wouldn't have named it Ten Days in the Hills. Um, and that was a challenge, and it, I knew it was going to be fun, and it was fun. Uh, but I also found, as I was writing, that I did want to bring in some of 
Boccaccio's own stories in Boccaccio's way. You know, when Boccaccio wrote the Decameron, he, uh, he did a lot of rewriting of earlier stories um, in a new um, venue. He used the names of people who were still alive and families who, he gave families um, odd relatives that he then put in his stories. And so the, the stories became very current because he would use the names of, of people who were, who might be reading the stories. And he consciously did this to, to update the stories. So I knew that I was going to do to Boccaccio what he had done to others. And um, one of the things that I did was I introduced several of his stories uh, into my narrative, updating them and changing them. My ten characters all, all are, live in Hollywood. One is a Hollywood director whose career has fallen a bit on hard times. Um, one is his current girlfriend who writes how-to books. Um, one is his former wife who's a big Hollywood star. Um, one, of one is her mother, who still lives in his guest house because she refused to move when the at the time of the divorce. Um, one is the next door neighbor, who's the mother's best friend. One is the star's new boyfriend, who is an enlightened guru of some uh, shady religion. Um, he's actually my favorite character. Uh, one is the daughter of the director and, and the former wife, who's now 23. One is the son of the new girlfriend, who is 20. And one is a visitor from an old friend of the director, who is about his age, which is 59, I think. And he is visiting from the East Coast. And this novel takes place uh, at the beginning of the Iraq War. It starts on March... 25th, no, March 24th, 2003, which is a uh, Monday, the day after the Oscars, um, which he has been to the night before, which I happened to go to that year. And it ends 10 days later. And they do the same thing that they do in the Decameron. They take refuge in the hills outside of town, and they keep to themselves, and they talk a lot. And that's exactly what they do in the Decameron. So this is day four. And um, they are standing around uh, eating. They're, they're getting ready to eat dinner. So they're cooking. And um, they're, ma they're, they're preparing the dinner, and soon they will sit down to eat dinner. The next-door neighbor is a woman named Cassie. She's one of those women that we... Um, that, that I know, she's based on a real person, who has been in Hollywood her whole life, or pretty much her whole life, and knows everybody and has seen everything and knows where all the bodies are buried. And uh, you'll see my, I'm sorry to say my paper. Oh, here it is, okay. So this takes place in Pacific Palisades. And um, Cassie, who's the older woman, Cassie's the older woman, Zoe is the movie star, and Cassie is about to tell a story um, about Henry Miller, who once lived in Pacific Palisades. Well, said Simon, what was he like? Delphine handed Stoney a knife, a cutting board, and a cucumber. He sat down at the island, and then Isabel sat beside him. He cut a slice off the cucumber, but Isabel stopped him and took the knife and the cucumber and began to shave off the dark green skin. Stoney smiled at her. Cassie said, he was a talker. I'm not saying he was a big talker, because that would imply that he couldn't back it up, but he did like to talk and talk, and talk dirty, of course. He was quite famous for talking dirty and making dirty talk popular, but mostly he just liked to talk. How'd you meet him, said Isabel. Oh, I was into art then, too, though I secretly thought all the best work was being done in macrame. She grinned. 
He told me a funny story about his life in Paris that I never saw printed in any of his books. Oh, do tell, said Zoe. Pour me a glass of wine, said Kathy. Zoe picked up the bottle, took a glass out of the cabinet, and poured a healthy serving. <coughs> Kathy took an appreciative sip and said, Well, as you can imagine, when Henry Miller first went to Paris, he did not hang out with the best people, but he was good-looking and sexy-looking. He caught the eye of a woman walking down the street. He told me it was the exact street that the tumbrils used to go down on their way to the guillotine. I got the feeling he wouldn't have paid any attention to her if he'd met her in the Louvre. Anyway, this woman invited him to her place one day when her husband was out. Henry thought she might give him something to eat, so he went. It turned out the husband was something like 35 years older than the wife. He was a doctor and had all these ideas about sexual energies and sexual hygiene, and so he only slept with his wife every month or so. Charlie said, well, lots of people think, shh, said Delphine. Kathy went on. Given Henry's predilections and good looks and the wife's crustaceans, it took them maybe about 10 minutes to get to it. And pretty soon she was mad for him and she wanted him to come to the house every day. He also liked one of her maids, so Henry was pretty happy. This being France, it was perfectly normal for the wife to pay him for his services, and so she bought him nice clothes. The husband would come and go, but he was a surgeon, so they always avoid him. Th so they could always avoid him. One day, the doctor was in the surgery preparing the anesthetic when he was called to the telephone, and he absentmindedly carried the container of anesthetic with him to the phone, laudanum or something. The phone call was about a huge traffic accident with lots of injuries. The doctor ran out and left the drug by the phone. He told his wife not to expect him for a couple of days, so she called Henry. Since they had the whole night, they decided to do it in every room. After he tied her up in the bedroom and she tied him up in the living room, he, she wanted to do it in the study just to get back at the husband for being so boring. So they went in there and they were about to do it when the wife decided she needed something to enhance her experience. Boots, said Simon, laughing. A camera. Shh, said Delphine and Elena simultaneously. <coughs> While she was out, Henry saw the stuff on the desk by the phone. He opened it, took a whiff, and then tried it. He always prided himself on being a transgressor and damn the consequences. And as he said to me, look at me now, I'm unkillable. It didn't matter what I tried. I had to try everything. I knew it even then. He did pass out on that occasion, though, because the drug was very strong. Well, the woman panicked when she came back in the room. Henry was, to all appearances, dead on the floor. She got the maid. They knew that there would be big trouble for everyone if Henry stayed there. Even though the wife quite liked him, she thought it would be best in the long run to get him out of the house. So the wife and the maid carried him out the back entrance and down the alley, I guess it was raining, and the wife just couldn't bring, him, bring herself to leave him there. So they put him si inside a big steamer trunk that was sitting under a portico and left the lid slightly ajar on the off chance that he wasn't dead. <laughs> of course, he pieced all of this together later. Pretty soon, a couple of drunks came walking down the alley, and they saw this trunk. When they went up to it, they happened to bump it so that it closed and locked. It was heavy and in this great neighborhood, so they thought it was worth stealing. They picked it up, and they did drop it once as they carried it down the alley, which was good for Henry because it landed on a rock and broke a hole through, <coughs> broke a hole in the bottom and let in some air, or he might have smothered. He slept on. When the drunks got home, they were tired, so they set the, they set the trunk on the back stoop, and they went upstairs and passed out. After a while, Henry came to, and he couldn't for the life of him figure out where he was or what had happened to him. He thought he might have been buried alive. It was dark and stuffy, and he was very stiff. For a moment, he began to panic, though, as he said to me, I am not the panicking sort, Kathy, and in those days, I was a cool customer. Did you ever see that famous picture of him in that fedora, said Stoney? He was a very cool customer. But then, continued Kathy, he saw the tiny shaft of light coming through the hole 
that had been knocked in the bottom of the trunk when it, had, when it was dropped, and he stopped panicking because, really, as he said to me, nothing scared me for long, Kathy, nothing at all, not even German fascism. He decided to try to turn over, and when he did, the trunk fell off the ledge it was on and broke in half, and Henry got out. He was still a little groggy, so he looked around for a moment, then staggered out into the street. Charlie spoke up. He said, you've got to be kidding. Kathy glanced at him, made a small face, and went on. <coughs> oh. <laughs> While he was regarding Isabel and Stoney, Isabel is his daughter, uh, Max's daughter, and only half listening to Kathy's story, thinking of the kids, not Henry Miller. He had a vivid Im image of Henry Miller, bald and skull-like, not 40 in a fedora, but 80 in pajamas and a robe, staggering in a half stupor around the streets of Paris, wondering what had happened to him. He said, did you ever see the movie they made of Tropic of Cancer? It had Rip Torn as Henry. I didn't, said Kathy, but when I knew him, that was a big topic of conversation for him, how it was going to make him a legend. Bogart will be nothing to me, he'd say. They also made Henry and June. I never saw that. Aren't they all alike, said Zoe. She shook her head. Dear one, she said to Paul, who was standing behind her in some funny white pants and a T-shirt beard and bare feet, you're the only man I know who doesn't want to be a Hollywood legend. Paul didn't say anything, but Max wasn't so sure she was right. Anyway, here's Henry, all disheveled and groggy, staggering around the Faubourg Saint-Germain with only one shoe on, and the gendarmes pick him up for disorderly conduct, and of course he starts arguing, which gets him in more trouble, because although he was a very charming man in his way, he did have an authority problem. So they put him in the clink. Everyone knew from hanging out on the left bank Everyone he knew from hanging on the left bank was just as happy to leave him in there, but the wife begins to worry. She sends the maid out to look around, and the maid reports that the, dr that the trunk has been carried off. Now the wife and the maid both go out looking, and they find the broken trunk a few blocks away, lying in another alley, and Henry's left a few things in the trunk, a shoe and a pack of cigarettes, so they know he's still alive. Right about this time, the drunk guys wake up and come down from the premier etage to the red chaussée, said Isabel, to see what's in the trunk. The woman, who is very well dressed, accuses them of stealing her trunk, and they deny it. But they look guilty, so she knows they did it. But still, where is Henry? The wife and the maid walk up and down the boulevards and don't see anyone, and the maid discreetly asks at a few cafes if anyone has seen anything of a man with one shoe who maybe looks a little ill. Finally, a waiter at one of the cafes says that the police took him off for vagrancy, and so the maid agrees to dress up nicely and go to the police station. At the police station, they aren't saying anything, but of course this is France, so the maid goes into the one of the cells with one of the guards, and the guard is good-looking, and the maid is pretty, and she convinces him that Henry is her boyfriend and that it was her fault he drank the opiate. And she can't tell the doctor, and so in short order, they let Henry out, and they give him his shoe and his cigarettes, and they take a cab to the house, and Henry can finally sleep it off in comfort. In the meantime, of course, the doctor comes home, and here is Henry in his bed, but the maid tells him the whole story, how Henry is a great American novelist who has become her lover and on top of that has come to Paris to learn about life and he had gotten thirsty and drunk the anesthetic by mistake and he nearly died and then the doctor remembers that it was he who left the drug lying about and so he decides not to press his luck. And after that, Henry kept on with the wife for another few months or so without the husband being any the wiser. Kathy shrugged. I always thought that was a good story, and I couldn't figure out why Henry didn't include it in one of his books, but he said there was nothing to be learned from it. It didn't fit in with the themes of the rest of his adventures, and anyway, his books were not autobiographical in the strictest sense, but if not, what's the point, I always thought. When I was in my English class last year, said Simon, we acted out a scene from one of his books. My part was to come in one door of the lecture room and shout, ah, ah, ah! and then go out again. I had to do that four times. What scene, said Elena from the stove where she was opening the oven door and bending down to look inside. 
I don't know, said Simon. I wasn't in the room long enough to make sense of it, but one girl did take her shirt off. I saw that. Good heavens, said Elena. She stood up, a fork in her hand. Well, she had a bra on. It was fine, Mom. Fine, I hate that word. But she smiled at Simon, then said, Anyway, these veggies are done, Delphine. <coughs> now the food began to be carried to the table, a big salad, the pot of pale, creamy green artichoke bisque, sprinkled with crispy croutons, a dish of caramelized roasted vegetables, a baguette of whole wheat bread, another dish of braised asparagus sprinkled with herbs. Charlie said, do you all ever eat meat? You've got to be kidding, said Isabel. As they were pulling out their chairs and sitting down at the table, Max was still thinking of Henry Miller. Of course, when he was with Ina and then right after he came to California, it had been clear to everyone that you couldn't achieve manhood without reading Topic of Cancer and at least sexist, if not the whole of the rosy crucifixion. If you had the time and the money, it was also desirable to go to Greece with a copy of the Colossus of Marusi. If not that, then some time in Big Sur might work almost as well. In college, there were the boys who read Ulysses and the boys who read Tropic of Cancer, and it was clear that the Tropic of Cancer boys were more daring and had more vitality and probably were better endowed and somewhat more brutal in their sensibility. Max had dutifully done his reading, aspired to be Miller rather than Joyce, and truth to tell, he couldn't remember a thing about any of the books. But he remembered that feeling he had, that excitement. This book had been banned. All through, life of, all through the life of his father, a person in the U.S. was not allowed to read this book. How precious the book was as a result. So precious, you carried, around, carried it around casually, but with the cover carefully obvious so that everyone in the world, your buddies, your teachers, the mailman, the cop on the corner, your girl would know that you were friends with Tropic of Cancer on intimate terms, utterly familiar, as unconsciously at ease with Tropic of Cancer as you were with your driver's license. <coughs> so he thinks a little bit about that. Well, and, and he says, so you're reading Henry Miller in school, Simon? You were supposed to. We did too, said Isabel, in my California authors class. Let's see, Mark Twain, Helen Hunt Jackson, Jack London, Nathaniel West, John Steinbeck, Henry Miller, Wallace Stegner. It was all pretty male. I thought Miller was nicer than the others, more Buddhist. The girls in the class kind of liked him. The boys liked Jack London. I heard he was gay, said Stoney. Who, said Zoe. Both of them, said Stoney. There's nothing wrong with that, said Isabel. Henry Miller was not gay, said Cassie decisively as she helped herself to the roasted vegetables. But there would be nothing wrong with it if he were, said Isabel with a stubborn note in her voice. It was this very note of mulishness that Max suddenly found provoking. He said, according to whom? Elena looked at him. Well, I don't know, said Isabel, a little startled. According to him, maybe. My guess, said Charlie, is that there would be a lot wrong with it, according to him, if he were still alive. I just meant that we shouldn't judge him for being gay if he were gay. That's all I meant. How about for not being a vegetarian, said Stoney. Should we judge him for that? Isabel Maxwell realized that she was being put on the spot, if only playfully. She said rather stiffly, but aggressively nonetheless, meat eating is a choice and being gay isn't. You can judge people for the choices they make, but not for ways that they are, that aren't choices. Who told you that, said Charlie. I think he was a vegetarian, said Cassie, from living in, <laughs> from living in Big Sur and following Buddhist precepts, said Paul gravely. It's funny to think of Henry Miller, the sex warrior, as being a gay Buddhist, don't you think? said Zoe mildly. It makes me laugh. He lived a long time, said Paul. You can espouse a lot of ideas in a long life, and most of them will be contradictory. That's what I said, said Cassie. He was a talker. While he was saying any given thing, he tried to sweep you away with it. This whatever it was was the greatest, best thing. There were all the reasons to convert to whatever belief he was urging upon you, 
But in the end, you couldn't convert to everything. He gave you reasons to convert to. Life was too short for that. However, he wasn't gay. So that's my simultaneous homage to Boccaccio and Henry Miller. Um, I do think, you know, it, it is, so many novelists have, uh, have rewritten uh, other people's works, and I'm one of them. And, and I'll say one, another one that I really have loved and that I recommend is uh, a book by Anthony Trollope called He Knew He Was Right, which is a rewriting of Othello. So um, I was at a dinner sometime in the fall, and I happened to be seated next to John Guare um, for some reason. And I don't know why we started talking about this, but we sort of looked at each other and said, he knew he was right. And we both looked at each other and said, yes, that's such a great book. And so it, there is no agony of influence. That's a critical idea. The novelist idea is the ecstasy of influence. Um, and that was what I discovered when I was writing this book, 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel. Um, now, I do, I would like, I realize I've been at this for probably half an hour, not quite, for 35 minutes, I guess. So do let's have questions and then we'll just keep going until they stop us. Yes. Well, I wanted to get away, as far away from, pre you know, current events as I could. And so literally I went and found books that were as far away as they could be. And the first one was The Tale of Genji, which is written in the year 1000, which was a wonderful book, another one that I recommend. Um, and then I read a few Icelandic sagas, which I uh, was already familiar with. And so now I was up to the end of the 13th century. And so the next one seemed to be um, Boccaccio because I only wanted to read prose. I didn't want to read poetry, so I skipped uh, Dante. Um, so it was a simple reason. But in fact, what I discovered was that all of those books brought me back to thinking about current events. Um, the, the Murasaki did because the philosophical underpinnings of the tale of Genji concern the fleeting nature of existence and and what it, one of the things that they do is to contemplate the fleeting nature of existence over and over and over again, which is a tremendous paradox considering that the tale of Genji has been in print for a thousand years. Um, but it was, it was very good for me to, to be asked to contemplate the, f the fleeting nature of existence um, uh, after 9-11. And then there was this kind of strange, um, I don't know, wh uh, what's it called when, when oh, synchronicity, because I would read the Icelandic sagas. Well, the Icelandic sagas are about the permanent uh, position of violence in human society. And then I turn to Boccaccio, and here I'm, we're talking about anthrax on the TV and reading about the Black Death uh, in the bedroom. <coughs> and then the next one I read was the much more obscure uh, book called The Heptameron, which is Marguerite, the Queen of Navarre's rewriting of Boccaccio. But the issue there th the b is there's 72 stories in, in the Heptameron, and probably the majority of them are about honor killings. So um, while we were thinking about the Afghan women, here I was reading about French women who are quite, um, quite in the same position as the Afghan women only, you know, four and 450 years ago. So that was a coincidence, but it, it reminded me that we don't, that the great thing about great literature is that it simultaneously takes us out of the present and brings and gives us perspective on the present. Um, and there was not a book of this hundred that I found irrelevant to my existence. They were all um, relevant in some way.
Yes, back in the back. Uh huh. Well, you know, I this morning uh, in the New York Times, um, what's his name? The uh, the guy who usually writes about Darfur, Nicholas Nicholas Kristoff said he should read Moby Dick. I think that's who it was. I said that in this book. You know, if 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 he'd read Moby Dick, maybe he would have thought twice about uh, going after that white whale um, and the cost there, the cost therein of obsession. Um, do I have any other recommendations that he should read? I don't know. My recommendations for him always always shift according to the circumstances. Around Hurricane Katrina time, I thought he should be reading um, Their Eyes Were Watching God, um, which it has a great scene at the end of a hurricane. Uh, they, cu- they, are, they are struck by a hurricane in Florida. Um, I guess I just think he should read lots of novels and stop reading about presidents who were vindicated in the end. Somebody else. Yes. Well, it varies from book to book. Um, when I did A Thousand Acres, I would lived in Iowa for a long time, and I'd been reading the Des Moines Register for a long time, and that was basically all I needed. You know, I've been reading the farm section of the Des Moines Register, and um, not only was there a lot of information about farming, but there were a lot of farmers who were quoted, so you could begin to hear their voices in your in your mind. Um, and of course, I read lots of other books too about the history of farming and about the farm crisis at the time. But I lived there um, when I read when I wrote. The All True Travels and Adventures of Liddy Newton, which takes place in around around Lawrence, Kansas, in 1856, um, there was a huge amount of material because it was an election year, and so lots of correspondence. Not only were there diaries and letters of people who had gone to Kansas thinking they were going to um, find paradise on earth, but there were also um, lots of newspaper accounts. Um, from various reporters who had been sent out from like New York and even London uh, to, f- to try and see what was going on uh, in Kansas during the Troubles. So I read a lot of those accounts and I got a good sense of the events and then I went to Lawrence and I walked around uh, in the area that I thought they might plausibly have lived and then that caused it to gel in my mind how things would have happened, where they would have gone, what they would have done. Um, for the horse racing book, I, I got that idea because I bought a horse that had, and, and I didn't know anything about him. And then I found out his racing record, and it was very long. And it, I became fascinated by racing. And uh, <coughs> so I went and talked to people at the racetrack, Santa Anita in particular, and, and Hollywood Park. And then I went to Del Mar. And then I discovered that I really liked going to the racetrack just anyway. But people, it was like the people at the racetrack, it had been a couple of generations since anybody had written a, a, a big horse racing novel. Ring Lardner was kind of the last one. And um, it was like they'd been waiting for someone to come and ask them their stories. You couldn't turn them off. I'd say, um, well, what do you think about blah, blah? <laughs> you know, it, and it was fascinating, great language, great stories, great adventures about horses and jockeys and owners. And... They do pride themselves on telling colorful stories. Uh, I never forget, uh, I went to see the movie Seabiscuit. The next day we were standing around, a couple, a bunch of trainers were standing around, and I was saying, uh, ta- and they were talking about how interfering the trainer of Seabiscuit was, according to the movie. And one of them said, well, you know what Eddie used to say, the only good owner is a dead owner. 
So I loved the racetrack. I loved the way they talked, and um, I loved the stories that they had to tell. And I loved their willingness to, to tell them. That was really lots of fun. So it varies from book to book. For this book, uh, 10 Days in the Hills, I did drive around Hollywood a lot uh, looking for my locations. But in fact, um, I didn't talk to very many people because um, because of the last of the kind of burgeoning of the DVD industry in the last six to ten years, they talk. You know, you buy the DVD or you you get the DVD from Netflix, and they tell you all about it, and they're very revealing in a way that they wouldn't necessarily be just to talk to you, and they're revealing in a quite a precise way. I think the two best. Um, commentaries I heard. One was by Sidney Pollack, who was just talking about the technical problems of filming out of Africa because of the elevation and the way the light was. So that was fascinating for me to hear a director talk about that. And it was also fascinating that his take on movie making was primarily technical rather than in terms of his inner vision, you know, which isn't always the case. But another great one, and one that I really recommend, is um, the uh, Liz Taylor Montgomery Cliff a version of A Place in the Sun. Uh, and Liz Taylor, who, as you, those of you who may remember this movie knows, she's just electrifying in the movie. She's incredibly gorgeous and compelling and um, 18 years old or something like that. But in her commentary, what she talks about is how this is her first movie basically as an adult. And she is good friends with Montgomery Clift. And she, in all the scenes that you think she's just blowing you away, according to her, she's trying to psych out what it is that Montgomery Clift is doing that makes him such a good actor. Um, and so it's very touching because she's very affectionate toward him. And, um, and so you watch the movie and then you listen to her talk about him and about herself as a girl. And it's a, it's a wonderful commentary. And, you, and so I couldn't have written this novel really without the DVD revolution because um, you would just never, or a person like me would just never be able to get that many 300 or 400 movie people to talk about their work to that extent. So that's how I wrote it. I can't give you any specific advice, but the, the general advice I would give is always go to the end of the first draft before showing it to anyone, because they, that's exactly what they do. They, they have a thought or an idea, which, which you then use as an excuse to not go to the end of the first draft, um, you being the writer in general. So I don't know why you showed it to her, but um, just take it back and write to the end of the first draft in your own way, and then show it to her. Okay. Well, I know, but th that's the thing. You, the first draft, you have to complete the first draft before you know how to complete the first draft. You cannot foresee how you're going to complete the first draft. You have to get there. And so I, I'm always a little leery of... Um, any advice, now this is not, doesn't have to do with a short story or poetry or an essay, but for a novel, any, anything that kind of holds you back from, from getting to the end of the first draft is, is not a good thing. So just forget about what that person said and go to the end of the first draft however you want, and then it'll, it'll be convincing on its own terms. And, and you'll know what those terms are, which you don't know at this point. 
Yes, sir, right there. Behind, yeah. Uh-huh. No. Uh, I'd, I'd be glad to look into the fabulous saga of solar panels. <laughs> That's where my interest lies. You know, my mother, my mother was a golfer, and she married an oil man, and I have since been entirely not interested in either golf or oil. <laughs> yes, in the blue shirt. Yes, you. Thank you. No, thank you. Well, you know, one of the things that I was self-conscious about um, when I started writing was that there weren't too many uh, women novelists that I knew of um, who had had children. Uh, if our sort of great women novelists were people like Jane Austen and Virginia Woolf who hadn't had children. And um, so I was very, I, I began to worry once I had children whether there was a deleterious effect there. Um, so I was pretty determined to keep at it um, even though I had the children. And, and in part to, to, to talk about what it is like to be a mother, and 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 that strange um, sort of f battle of feelings. I remember I was walking across the campus at Iowa State, and it didn't matter how pregnant you were, you still couldn't park next to your building. Um, so I was re I remembered I remember taking that long long walk across campus, and I was about eight months pregnant, and I was teaching. A Nabokov. I think I was teaching Panin, but I was teaching a series of modern novels, and I and I couldn't figure out: can you teach Kafka and be pregnant at the same time? <laughs> Doesn't one cancel out the other? And I guess I thought that I decided that that was my purpose as a novelist was to prove that you can read Kafka and still reproduce. Um, and and still have hope for your children's future. Let me say one more thing about that. Um, one of the fascinating things about reading these novels, especially in chronological order, was that yes, there was a period in the 20s and the teens where it did seem like not only life in general, but the form of the novel broke down, and that the novelists themselves were, were struggling to express um, the 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 feelings that they had about the end of uh, European life that they sensed after the First World War, and so a lot of novels from the 20s and from that period are are similar to Ulysses in that they are difficult uh, formally. Uh, the novelist chose to innovate formally in order to express a new thing and, and express it some way in some ways out of sequence. But at the end of the 20th century, the young novelists um, who, who in many ways had experienced uh, things that were at least as horrible as the First World War and in some ways more horrible than First World War were back to realism. And I realized that this, that one of the effects of the novel as a, a work of art is that it can't help being sequential. So it doesn't matter how much the author breaks up the sequence and breaks up the form and breaks up the time scheme, it reads as if it's giving cause and effect. And so the, 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 the writers of the 90s had been trained by the books of the 20s to think that you could understand things even that the authors of the books of the 20s didn't understand. And to me, that's an aspect 
that's a function of the novel as a piece of sequential writing. And um, so anyway, that was one of the insights that su surprised me when I was reading all those books. Yes. Well, there's two. One's a fiction book called Horse Heaven, and one's a nonfiction book called A Year at the Races. And in Horse Heaven, the horses win, and in A Year at the Races, they don't. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Yes, in the red hat. You meant, do I literally have a cookie jar? Yeah. Um, no, I eat a lot of cookies, but I, I generally don't um, use any kind of um, device to remember things. I've, at this point, I have, uh, I've got a pretty good memory, and I think if it goes in, it'll come out later um, without me needing to designate it. If I need it, it'll come out. So... Yeah, I, I, I write for about two hours a day. It depends on the horse schedule, really. Um, because my trainers usually have a more strict schedule than I do. So once I get the 14-year-old off to school, then I write that I ride. But it's, it can be either, it, you know, it's, it, it doesn't, it's not a strict schedule. I don't believe... You know, if there are any aspiring novelists here, um, discipline is good, ritual is bad. You don't want to get to the point where you have say, I have to write between 2.06 and 5.02 or I can't write. You have to be able to just sit down and do it um, and to be determined to sit down and do it. But you can't, you have to learn to break down any kind of ritual parameters that because those are about preventing you from writing rather than allowing you to write. Yes. Of what? Oh, well, I, you know, I have a long entry in Beloved, uh, about Beloved in here. And um, I thought that uh, she was very clever because um, there's a chapter in here called The Circle of the Novel which takes 12 um, types of written literature that the novel is similar to or related to. And, um, and it takes particular novels. And it puts, if I put that novel in the middle and then I choose the ones that um, it seems related to, then it can tell me something about the author's strategy and what it's tried to do. And one of the things that... <coughs> Morrison wanted to do, I think, was to circumvent um, traditional forms of narrative history in order to tell us something that would seem to be newer and truer than what we already knew. And so what she used, she used the tale in order to do that. And um, so we go bit by bit back into the lives of the characters only through what they tell us and also through this idea of the ghost story. Um, what that does is it prepares us for the horror of the climax and it also implies to us that this is, this is the real truth, that this is the truth that people know and remember as opposed to the official truth, which is wrong. And to me, that was, when I read Beloved, I thought that was very convincing, and I thought it was a great strategy. And if we talk about this, the circle of the novel, I think I said that um, Beloved, I, I, I'm sorry, it's going to take me a moment. I have to find the exact two that I said it was more closely related to. Because you can't read beloved without being reminded of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And one, one of the two novels 
came into the culture and was accepted. And the other one has been inflammatory from the first day until now. Never not inflammatory. And I, I th that always uh, intrigued me. And then when I used the circle, this novel clock, to think about it, I realized that um, I'm almost there. Tundra, make it concave. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, I'm in the tail. Um, I, by using the tail and gossip, um, she's she avoids doing what um, Stowe did, which was to use polemic and epic. There are no two categories more inflammatory if you combine them than polemic and epic. Because polemic always says, these are the things that are wrong, and epic always says, this is what your people or your nation are like. And so it doesn't matter who you think the people or the nation is. If you think it's the United States, if you think it's the South, if you think it's black people, if you think it's white people, if you're, if you're reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, you can't help but be inflamed by the polemic for some reason, whatever reason that is. Um, and you can appreciate other things about it, and I certainly do. But um, clearly, Toni Morrison wanted to do a different thing. She wanted to sneak in the truth rather than throw it at people. And she succeeded in doing that. And I, I, you, you may know that in the Last winter, the New York Times asked a bunch of writers what the best novel the last 25 years was, and it, and it was Beloved. Um, and I certainly voted for Beloved, and that's why. But I have noticed that among uh, other writers, it, it's a little controversial. And it's not because of her technique. It's mostly because uh, they like Philip Roth better. Don't ask me why. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>